So I'm Mark Gelfo, uh, Managing Principal uh, with TLC Engineering, Engineering Solutions. Um, my background is I'm the MEP guy. Derek Brandt, Walter P. Moore, he's the envelope guy. Say hi, Derek. Hi. <laughs> hi, Derek. <laughs> Derek and I have worked together on commissioning projects for going on 10 years, or at least that's what we say in the marketing materials. Um, and our process of, of integrating the envelope and the MEP sides has evolved uh, over time from being kind of separate and like, you know, separate paths to what we like to think of as a pretty integrated synergistic process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Hence the title, whole greater than some of the parts, mostly because Derek wouldn't let me call it two great tastes that taste great together, which is what I wanted to name it. But that got vetoed. So, <laughs> Uh, mandatory uh, AEA, AIA slides. Um, like I said, what we're going to talk about is a little bit about a little bit about the process, building envelope commissioning and MEP commissioning, and how they work together. But mostly, what we want to try to hit is the synergies and how, if we have a really integrated process, that that will save everyone, especially the owner, time and money and effort. Um, and then we'll give some good, what we think are good stories and good examples um, throughout the the project or process presentation. We like to start with with the basics, right? The foundation. So you get it. It's a foundation. It's good. It's good All story. right. These are the jokes, folks. Um, it's a tough crowd, Mark. It's tough. Jeez. Jeez. Well, yeah. anyway, I was going to say, I didn't realize that that's why Derek put that slide in there because it was foundation until like yesterday. So um, I'm a little slow. So, well, let's start with how many people are actual commissioning providers? You do commissioning on a day-to-day basis, right? Okay, shocker. Um, so have you ever heard of any of these complaints, misconceptions, questions? Um, you know, commissioning, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna cost too much, it's gonna affect our budget, uh, it's gonna affect our schedule, it's gonna delay the whole process. Um, why do I need to commission anything besides the mechanical systems? Is there electrical? Why do I need to commission the envelope at all? Or why do I even have to commission? Doesn't the, isn't the architect and the general contractor just going to take care of, of all these things? Um, you know, why do any of this at all? Isn't the contractor just going to, you know, fix it all? And um, you know, wouldn't it just be? This is my favorite. Wouldn't it just be cheaper just to fix problems when and if they come up at the end? Right? That makes sense. <laughs> Anybody hear anything like that? Well, the, those are the things we all hear all the time. Obviously, in this crowd, I use. Are there any architects in the audience? Good, because I'm going to talk bad about Permission architects to speak free. throughout. <laughs> this, is, this kind of slide is more for the architects when we present to, to them. But anyway, oh, this is being recorded too. So our premise is that rather than treat each of the disciplines that are going to be commissioned in their individual silos, that if we're going to have true whole building commissioning, then we need to take a whole building commissioning approach. And that includes and starts with the team and how we integrate the team and the, and the process. So one team, one building, one owner. Right, and so that brings us to the building enclosure. And you know, today's building enclosure is more complicated than ever than that, as we know. It's that the, the building materials themselves are more complicated and more complex and multi-layer construction. There's many trades involved now. It's not a single trade. There's, to, to couple that and make that worse, the, the walls are thinner, right? Gone are the days of mass walls to where, yeah, it really doesn't need to be air and water tight. The whole thing's so thick that it doesn't really matter. Not much will get through anyway. Uh, gone are those days. But with that, we have higher performance requirements, right? It's now into the building code. You have to do X and X thing with your building enclosure with regard to air and water and thermal uh, requirements. But then making that worse, they're also gone are the days where we have where we have skilled craftsmen with apprentices and then generations and generations of masons that have been doing masonry and fenestration and glazing for years and years. A lot of times these guys are on on site doing the best they can with the experience they have, but in fact of the matter is it's relatively limited. The majority of their training's been on the job. But that doesn't stop us as an industry from having higher expectations and wanting better projects in less time and in less money, which you know we should expect more of ourselves, but it just makes it difficult from a building enclosure perspective. And on the MEP side, it's the same thing. These bu buildings are not getting less complex, right? These are highly technical, highly complex technical buildings that we are trying to make to be high performing buildings, or at least prove that they are high performing buildings. Lots of different systems trying to work together 
integrated systems testing is you know something that you all uh, deal with all the time. And, and like Derek said, um, you know the the, the technicians. There, there's fewer and fewer young technicians coming in in the control side and being able to test these things. Um, but the expectations, you know, continue to be higher on the more complex systems and can you get it done faster and you know cheaper. So. So our, again, our premise is that the you call traditional approach or the way we, we've seen it done a lot is that the envelope's doing their thing over here and the MEP is doing their thing over there, which is mostly mechanical, but you know, with a little E and P maybe in there. And that we believe that if we integrate that approach, it's this, you know, the uh, commissioning processes are the same, the goals are the same, it's the same team, it's the same owner, the schedules might be a little different and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, as we move forward, but one team, one owner, same objectives, why wouldn't we have an integrated team approach, right? And again, that starts with, starts with the team. I've, I've actually had several conversations with people just even since the conference started uh, yesterday about the different systems being commissioned and the expertise that is needed in, you know, to, to be able to do that. You can't, the days where the mechanical guy goes, mechanical commissioning guy goes in and does, you know, the, the, all the mechanical and okay, I'll test some lighting controls too while I'm there. That, that's not the way we see it anymore. We're testing, for testing all these different systems, we need people with that expertise to be able to, to be part of the team. One, you know, usually still, still one team, so you know, one project manager, one lead commissioning provider, lead commissioning authority with you know, the smartest people wearing the smartest hats in all these different systems, including and especially the envelope side. Right. And the right. test and testing as well, right? You may have a single point of contact building and closure commissioning provider, but within there, behind the scenes, he's using his team of experts, sub sub experts in the in the various components of building and closure. Not unlike a design team. Derek mentioned briefly before about code requirements and where you know where the requirements are coming from are continuing to include both more MEP systems and envelope systems. So you're all aware that for a while now the IECC has required commissioning by code or at least a certain level of commissioning. Um, certainly it's not a best practices commissioning, but, it, but it's something for mechanical systems and water heating and, and for lighting controls. Um, but did you know? Yeah, and we touched on it a minute ago on the first slide on the building enclosure. It's now in the building code and, and air barriers have made their way into the building code in the IECC. Uh, with regard to you either have to have your materials tested for air permeance resistance or assemblies or your building and they kind of move the decimal point once to, once to the right on every one of those. But it's usually an, an either or uh, type of situation. You either have to have your material tested or your assembly tested moving to the center or your whole building tested. It's very rare when you wouldn't have your assembly or material tested right, in advance of of putting these products on your on your building, nobody's usually mixing these in their garage, uh, but air, those are required. So, and then you move to fenestration, same deal. A IECC requires uh, has certain requirements for air leakage through fenestration. You can see these components in fenestration are all different. They have all different requirements for air leakage, and there's the test procedures on the side. But the point of these slides is to note that it is included in the building code these days. I'm I have conversations all the time where owners or architects or even architects are surprised that these are these are mandatory requirements out of the IECC it means they, you have to do these on every project they're surprised enough that they have to have commissioning of a mechanical system but you know when we get into these these are re mandatory requirements of the code so the code is is moving towards more towards whole building commissioning slow slower than we might like but we're moving in that direction just the way lead is you know moving in that same direction and Lead, ver lead version four was the first uh, uh, dabblance in requiring some envelope pieces to be commissioned. As you know, the prerequisite doesn't include actual testing, but you know at least a drawing review and inclusion of the requirements in the BOD and the OPR. And then of course, you've got options for enhanced commissioning to commission the envelope, which I always push for, or well, we push for on all, pro all projects, but um, it's about time. But things are moving in that direction for an integrated approach um, and of course everybody's involved you, you guys know this so I get, we get the question all the time like I don't I don't have a role I don't have to be at that meeting do I because I'm not involved with commissioning yes for the love of Mike you do have to go everybody's involved everybody has a role in the project from the design team and the architects and the engineers 
the contractors and all the subs and the vendors, certainly the facilities people, everybody's involved, everybody needs to be at the table. I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit. So that's the foundation. Let's talk a little bit about the commissioning process, which you are all intimately familiar with, but you know, the commission, Process is the process, no matter what you're trying to commission, right? So it's just trying to show that building envelope commissioning process and the MEP commissioning process, it's the same process. So we should integrate that process together from the very beginning phases. And we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk a little bit about each of these phases and what happens in each one. Now, timelines are a little different, right? On the MEP side, you know, we, we're, we're all doing our, just, we all start together. We're doing our drawing reviews together, doing the, the, doing the design phase stuff together. But you know, on the MVP side, we usually have this gap while the building is going up, um, which, you know, it, but on the envelope side, that's when Derek is starting to do his, do his stuff. And then he's got a gap after the building's there. You know, everybody's waiting for the closeout. So if we can integrate that process and help each other out, we end up with something that, you know, really covers those gaps a little bit better so that we're, out, we're working as a team from the start of the project to the end of the project. When I say these things, it sounds like so obvious and common sense that I'm like, why are they even here listening to us talk about this? But I think it's, it's rare that we see these processes integrated like this. Right, so here we are trucking along the process and now we're into the pre-design and design phase. And this is really where we, we like to have the, the conversations both from mechanical and, and enclosure, but sit at those, sit at those meetings and, and really set ourselves up for success with the OPR workshop and evaluate the BOD, ask the probing questions that they may not know enough to ask the question or, or know that they have a preference on these things until we bring them up to them. So for example, you, you, you wanna start with where the project is being built, what type of project it is, do you have anything that are, things that are working against you right off the bat from an envelope perspective, from a mechanical perspective, or from a tie-in together. This one is kind of a, a photograph that represents a, a project we had right there on the St. John's River in Jacksonville, and then, then immediately we, we jumped into the discussion of waterproofing and below, below grade uh, concerns for parking garage and occupied spaces there. So just kind of getting that information out. Worst case scenario, we would, don't want an owner left with a building and say, this isn't what I wanted at the end. If they're, if they're savvy enough to, to want the, the commissioning process, we want them to know we want them to know all the questions they didn't maybe even know enough to ask up front. Uh, another thing that kind of ties us together here, do we have any artificial moisture uh, concerns on the inside of the building? You know, obviously in Florida, we're gonna have a lot of moisture outside of the building. Do we also have some on the inside that we need to manage and take care of both from an enclosure and a mechanical perspective? Uh, defining performance is something really important as, long as, as, as well as defining uh, maintenance intervals and amount of maintenance on a building. You, you know, a picture of a mock-up was too early to talk about mock-ups in the OPR. Not really. We want to make sure that the owner has this in mind. We want to make sure the builder has this in mind, the designer has this in mind, that we can all march forward together and include this in the, uh, the design and the budget and the schedule so that we get usable mock-ups that we can actually test later and we'll, we'll touch on those later. Um, further on the discussion of defining the performance, okay, it's, it's great when, when you define a, uh, uh, a window performance to a PSF test, right? But what does an owner want to know? That at X, X uh, miles per hour storm event, is their building going to perform? And will they know what that number is? So that if a storm comes through and they have water in their building, will they know, well, that was more than I, more than I decided to make this building resist? Or were they, where they asked those questions up front and they knew exactly what their building was, was designed and built to, uh, to resist. And we kind of skip over the, the importance of the OPR, right? I'm sure that many of you, I'm sure you all get a very thorough, well thought out OPR handed to you as you start your commissioning projects, right? Yeah, okay, well good, then every no problem. We skipped over the part where that doesn't happen, so we like to have an OPR workshop. And, um, it's one of the things as we've gone through our processes separately, you know, to Derek, that's even more important than it is to us on the MEP side. The, I love the example of the, uh, the mock-ups, but the project we're, we're working on right now had this issue with the windows where, well, you can tell the story, Derek. Right, story. yeah, I mean, they just, they just didn't really know what, what level, again, what, what level of performance they were getting, right? They, they saw the specification, architect wrote it up, and it was specified for a certain PSF or a certain positive design pressure to meet building code minimums, but 
building code minimum positive design pressure equated to a certain laboratory test for water intrusion, then that's when you, you reduce that again, that's what you get in the field. Well, is that what the owner wanted? Turns out they wanted more than that, right? So we had to kind of go back late in design to get them more than that, which was more than building code required, uh, but they did in fact want more and in fact they, they did get more. And certainly just a plug for envelope commissioning process, if it wasn't for Derek on that project, the windows would have been submitted for what they were at whatever it was, 40 miles per hour. And nobody would have said boo about the fact that until they it was later. specified for more and the owner wanted more until you know, it would have been a problem after the fact. But really, as we march on through design and we start working, we work with the designer. We're, we've moved away from the owner a little bit. We're working with the designer and the architecture team. We're, we're looking out for the four control layers. We're, we're trying to control water, movement of air, bulk water, air, vapor, and thermal concerns for the building. Those are the four control layers that we are most concerned with when we are working with the architect from a design, uh, I hesitate to say development, but uh, we're, we're working with them from an owner's perspective to improve their design for those four control layers. Working with, working with Derek, I learned that that's just, that's everything he cares about. Water, air, vapor, thermal. It's I'm a simple guy. It over and over and over again. So on the MEP, on the MEP side from a design page, we can write the design review you know, comments probably before we get a set of drawings. And a lot of it is related to sequence of operation. And on the mechanical side, you know, usually there is a sequence of operation. Sometimes it's boilerplate you know, or not edited, which, but it's, there's something there. But I'm a big proponent of if a, any system has to do more than like two things in a row, then we should write a sequence of operations. And we don't see them on the other disciplines. Plumbing, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm an electrical guy, so the biggest problem we have on, on generator testing is almost always the fuel system, that nobody's really thought through the sequence of operations of what's supposed to happen with main tanks and supply pumps and return pumps and all through that. And it, you know, just having that is a, a very important. Same thing with lighting controls, you know, which seems straightforward. My daughter likes to tease me that, you know, so all you do is turn the lights on and off. It's a little more complicated than that, but not yeah, really, but yes. <laughs> so, and she's 21, by the way, so it's not like she's, anyway. Um, but just lighting controls, nobody ever writes a sequence of operations for lighting controls. If we've got daylight sensors and occupancy sensors in the same room, which is controlling, which is governing, what foot candle levels do we want them to turn on and off on? Um, and then emergency power systems testing, I, I always want to see a Upon loss of utility power, the following shall happen. And we hardly ever get that. Uh, transfer switch, time delay programming, I show up for, you know, to witness some testing and they're all asking me what the time delays should be and so I tell them. No, not really. <laughs> not really. Um, and so then, back to the synergies of, of us working together in one process, uh, Again, something that's pretty straightforward, design review comments. We keep a common log of all of the system, MEP and building envelope commissioning uh, design review comments so that it's tracked in one platform so that the owner doesn't have to get one set of comments from Derek and one set of comments from me or heaven forbid, multiple sets of comments. And who's ever at the top of that org chart, you know, who's ever the lead commissioning provider is the one for responsible for making sure that all gets collected, to make it easier for, uh, for the owner. Pretty straightforward stuff. We use CX Alloy, um, but you know whatever platform you use, as long as it's one process, one platform. And specifications, again, stuff that should be no-brainers. But we we when we started, and we still see it on other projects uh, today, where there's might be two or three even front end specification sections on the commissioning process or the testing process that may or may not say the same thing. Usually not, or they can contradict each other, which just it just drives me insane when things you know, don't mesh the way they're supposed to and don't reflect what the actual project is trying to accomplish because nobody read it and they just took the last specs from the last job. So you know, we're big proponents of one common front end section that addresses the scope and the testing requirements of you know, each of the disciplines. Now that's not to say that we don't also still need the, the Division 23, 26, 22, 23, 26 sections and, Four, three, four, and seven, what, eight, yeah, nine. whatever the, yeah. whatever the envelopes, those is. numbers. But the point is, is that it's one spec that says the same thing, so we don't have contradictions. We're not trying to give uh, anybody an opportunity for change orders. And then, of course, one commissioning plan rather than two separate commissioning plans 
We're just saving everybody a lot of trouble and a lot of, a lot of headache on the front end stuff. It's, again, should be straightforward, but you'd be surprised. Oh, this is me still. Sorry. So uh, we talked about the design phase. Um, now we're into the construction phase. Um, you know what we do in the construction phase. We're, we're you know, going to having, having meetings and doing site observations. So let's talk about meetings. The first trick, tip of a meeting is make sure that if your partner is sitting across the table from you and he's holding his camera up like that, that you're not doing anything dumb while he's taking your picture and you didn't know it. Um, but rather again, rather than have two separate kickoff meetings, one for envelope and one for MEP, most of the players are the same, the owner, the general contractor, the operations folks, let's have one meeting where we can talk about everything all at once. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody needs to be there. Yes, we might get a little pushback from you know, the controls contractor or the electrical sub or something. It's like, why do I have to listen about the envelope? Well, there'll be other stuff too. Pay attention to the whole meeting. Um, doesn't matter, you're not gonna listen and we're gonna have to repeat the same thing at the next meeting anyway. So, And then the same thing with construction phase meetings as we move forward. Now, admittedly, meetings earlier in the process are going to be more envelope focused uh, or maybe entirely about the envelope. And then later in the process, they're going to be more about the mechanical systems or the electrical systems or whatever. But we're actually there to represent the whole team so that we can help cover each other and cover each other's issues. Not that we have to be experts in every discipline, but that we can you know, talk intelligently and bring questions, bring questions back. This is an actual example from one of the projects where I was at a meeting and did a walkthrough and you know, there were some things came up about the envelope. I made some notes about the... Um, you know, insulation's not involved. There was this uh, not installed yet, uh, which is a big deal in the attic space. And then there was the whole thing about this window detail and this piece of whatever is supposed to go all the way to the slab. It, it doesn't matter what the detail was. It's like I was there, so the owner said, "Okay, Mark, you're you're the commission, lead commissioning authority, so I could take that and then take it back to to my partners and say, "Okay, here's here's. Did you know about this? We need to address it." Rather than they have to wait another two weeks or four weeks to bring that up with the right people there. It's one process, one team. Same thing with uh, as design review comments, construction issues logs, one log that we're maintaining together. The issues are tracked, you know, are tagged with what discipline they are anyway, so the owner doesn't have to keep up with multiple punch lists. Right, so now we're into construction and we're looking at uh, doing site observations. One of the first things we're going to do is look at the performance mock-ups. We talked about that earlier in the OPR. Hopefully we got involved in that stage and we had that discussion. And it was in the design and, and in the budget and in the schedule and we are, are able to go out there and look on those. You know, bottom left one is a, is a good example of how we like to have a mock-up look minus any type of cladding, which is really kind of a secondary barrier for any of the four control layers I mentioned earlier. It's really just a backup. We want to be able to observe and test it in that condition uh, versus having everything put on it. Uh, and then again, once we move past mock-ups and into actual components and claddings being put on buildings during construction, this is really our last chance to protect the design. We did all this work in, in pre-design, design and submittals and reviewed it all. Every, everybody had it just the way they wanted it. We want to make sure that at the leading edge in the end, Everything is put down as it's supposed to. Are those roof adhesive ribbons spaced as they're supposed to? Are the right fasteners in the clay, to, uh, clay tile roof? Um, and as that waterproofing proper, is it being left out? Is it being installed with a lapse proper? Those type of things. And, and the thing we can constantly remind everyone about is that you know our job during construction phase is just to protect protect the design, like the slide says, or like Derek said, because uh, you know we're not trying to enforce anything that. We're not trying to make stuff up. We're not trying to force anything that's not already been the intention or the discussion at previous meetings. So both from the envelope side and the MEP side, although on the MEP side, we tend to look at more protecting the operations too. You know, can we get and maintain these things? Are we introducing indoor air quality problems into the job? Or can we get, can we actually open a door and get in, the, get in to replace a coil or a filter, things like that? These following slides are what I like to call Things I can't unsee. I just like to take pictures on job sites and say, what the heck, man? So follow along with me here. This is my we're ready for testing honest slide. It doesn't happen just to the controls people and the mechanical people. Yeah, we're ready to test the electrical systems too. 
So flying up to Pennsylvania so that you can test the generator, we'll finish wiring it after you get here. Um, this is just a picture of me being a smart ass. Um, let's stick your hand, we see all kinds of things um, in existing <laughs> conditions. This was a new detail that I missed during my design review, I guess, the two microwaves connected to temporary power on the job site uh, detail. When one microwave isn't enough. <laughs> Sorry, this, this is a hospital, it's more cool motion sensor out and I just start bursting out laughing because I said this is the early warning system for the zombie apocalypse. I watched a lot of Walking Dead too. Um, we tested the, we test a lot of access control, door security stuff, and it doesn't matter what system is. We tested it yesterday before you got here. It worked fine, except why, why, is, why aren't the doors de-energizing on fire alarm? Because the fire alarm wiring hasn't been pulled to the, to, to the controller yet. I don't know how they had, it actually worked the day before. Maybe they pulled the wire out overnight. I'm not sure. Um, and we... <laughs> And we went for like a half an hour as to why this wasn't working before we went into the room. And I said, what the heck, man? Sorry. Um, sometimes we don't get involved early enough during, uh, during a design phase. Um, you know, we're supposed to start. Some people think that we can start right after construction has begun. And we do add value uh, sometimes because we can, add, we can see things that should have been added in the design so that you know, they don't have to be added during the construction phase. It happens to be emergency stop for a generator that when I went to do the testing, I'm like, all right, where's the remote emergency stop? Well, I don't know, we don't have one of those. Okay, well, we should put one in. Um, this is also a good one. The engineer went to the trouble. This is a generator room, exterior louvers. The engineer went to a great deal of trouble to specify these vertical uh, rain resistant, you can have a hurricane and not get any water penetration or very little water penetration into the room, but nobody thought through, um, including us, you know, how the two, how the louvers, you know, come together. There was no detail, so there was just this big gap in between them. They ended up fixing it, but um, I know that if the project hadn't been commissioned, that it would have been the first rainstorm that would have said, hey, why is there water all in this generator room? So, anyway. Right, so here we are continuing on. We're now into acceptance, sigh of relief. We've made it to this point, but here's the part where we prove it, right? We've done all this work, it's all been installed, and now we prove it. Shouldn't be a lot of failures here, but this is really kind of the, the performance testing uh, portion of the, of the project, right? And so I'll just run through some of the tests we, we, that we commonly oversee from a commissioning perspective from the building enclosure. We touched on this one earlier. Remember back in air barriers, you either have to test the materials or the assembly or the whole building, right? This is a test of the whole building. It's not a common test in the private sector to do. It is required in military projects, right? So you see it on those, uh, but that's a test we commonly oversee and help, help set that testing criteria, right? The, our U.S. Army Corps has their criteria, but what do we use in the private sector? It's something we talk about during the OPR phase. It's great to tell someone that you either passed or failed that test, but if it's a fail, they're going to want to know where they leaked so they can go back and fix it. So this is how we locate some of the leaks. Uh, by use of, there's several ways we'll, we'll, we'll see here. This, this one uh, here that we're showing is a tracer smoke option, and you can visually see where the smoke is moving to or being blown away from, depending if you're pressurizing or depressurizing. Mark's going to play a riveting video here of some uh, air leakage by detection fluid, which if you've ever uh, looked for a leak in your uh, automobile or bicycle tire, if you've ever had a bicycle, I'm sure that it has had a flat tire. Same deal here. Uh, put some fluid on there, create a section, look for the bubbles. Doesn't look like that would immediately have been a location that would have leaked, uh, but you can uh, prove it quantitatively with that test. Same well, test method. The bubbles are bad. Yeah, that's what bubbles, I was told. Bad movement of smoke, bad. Okay, sorry. Uh, staying on air barriers for a minute, right? We want to make sure that those are adhered to the surfaces of which they were originally installed. Does no good to apply those, put your brick veneer on, and then they all peel down and fall down in the bottom. We want to make sure that those adhered and our test methods, we can oversee and specify criteria for those as well. Uh, let's move into, into water uh, control, right? There are various tests that can be done and specified for a water intrusion. This is the simple uh, spray nozzle test, pressure between 30 and 35. Uh, the spray nozzle about a foot away from the specimen test, one minute per foot. Uh, so there's that one in action. Looks like a pretty successful test. 
don't know why people have to hire you for that. They just need a garden hose and yeah. I mean, you know, it's really it's right. Just, yeah, they, these yeah, are the kinds of things Lowe's, people say to one, us. One like, trip to Lowe's and you get your <laughs> testing covered. So, but that test is uh, really something that you can use not only for fenestration windows, blazing skylights, and things, but you can also use that for for various facade uh, interactions. Corners are a popular place when two facades meet. Uh, that they may not have that detailing proper. This one we picked out as a, as a possible uh, leakage location. Lo and behold, it did, and we had to peel off that cladding there on the left and fix that up water lap that they had behind there that was leading to some leakage, but we got it fixed, so we provided some value there. Yay. Uh, here's another one, uh, water intrusion. Water intrusion testing by the chamber test, right? You put a chamber on the inside, spray some water on the outside, replicates a storm event. And uh, it's a, that is a, a very common, commonly used test in, in, uh, in the acceptance phase of enclosure commissioning projects. Uh, another one that is commonly used if you have some limitations, either interior access or time restraints, and you have relatively low construction, this one has some limitations as far as how high it can be used, but this is a good one in that it, you don't have to build a pressure chamber on this one, air and water on the outside. If that looks suspiciously like a, uh, an engine and a fan off the back of a fan boat, it's because it is. Uh, but AMA puts forward some standards to where you can, uh, you can dial in the RPM of that, uh, of that engine and the fan, fan propeller speed to a mile per hour storm event and test via that method. I just have to pause for a moment and say, uh, I'm still amazed that owners don't want to do this level of testing you know, during a lot of them you know, during the design and during the, the actual construction. But, you know, the first hurricane that comes through through Florida, which we have some, you know, that, that happens, and they get water in the building, or maybe not a hurricane, because that's pretty obvious where it came through, but it's just, you know, they start getting water in the building. And who do they call? They call me, because, you know, it's water in the building. They assumed it's, you know, condensation, so. All right, so we have a little video of this one, I believe, that shows this one in action. That, that photograph's not very exciting, but this video is a little bit better. Apologies for the relatively low resolution, but it gives you a feel for kind of the speed and the amount of water and, and how that test all looks. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's a good test for if you have some, uh, some time restraints. You can get in and do a lot more tests in a day than you can with the chamber tests. Uh, electronic leak detection on roofs as well. You know that common specifications call for a flood testing of the roofs. I'm not usually a big fan of installing a roof and then let's flood it to see if it works okay. I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather not, not inundate it with a lot of water, although even the electronic leak detection low voltage requires wetting of the surface. I like to try to recommend the uh, high voltage electronic leak detection. Not all roofing systems and manufacturers are up to speed there and have uh, product approvals with the conductive layer in place that you need over top of the insulation to complete the circuit. If it's direct over concrete, that's fine, but we have so much insulation in, uh, in roofs these days that typically it's not direct over concrete. But the industry is catching up and we're getting there. And I think that that one on the right will be kind of the preferred test method for roofs as part of uh, QA. I'm even less of a fan of flooding the roof with water and then applying electricity to it. But Derek says that's a well, good thing, that, so. That, that guy looks safe, doesn't he? <laughs> so some, uh, some tests you can do for a roof to confirm uplift uh, resistance. We like to do that in Florida, hence the, because of the, uh, the hurricanes and high weather, high wind events that we get here. There are two different ways to do that. There's the, the uh, chamber in which uh, there's a little blower motor. I don't know if you can see on the top or not. It creates a suction, you can dial that in, step it up slowly until you meet the uh, hit the required uplift resistance, or you can just stick a piece of plywood to the roof, put a, uh, put a pressure, uh, a, uh, a gauge in, the, in, in line with it to determine how hard you're pulling it and measure for resistance in that, in that manner. And then after you, uh, hopefully you don't have a lot of failures, but if you do, you do wanna cut it open and kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, this was one that was supposed to be a torch down uh, system. As you can see, not much torching went on there. Those fasteners are quite clean on top and that, that uh, the bottom of that, those plies are nice and shiny, just plain never got hot enough. And that was hmm. a systematic failure all across the roof, so. It didn't help that you guys were pulling on it. Yeah, we shouldn't have cut it open and pulled it. <laughs> that was a problem. Um, you know, another one that you can do a little bit more, uh, a, little, a little bit quicker and um, less expensive and, and potentially less intrusive, do an infrared scan after, after the roof has been complete. Uh, look for look for areas that are that stay warmer longer. Higher thermal mass, more water. Higher thermal mass keeps them warmer longer. You look for that after the sun stops shining on that surface. This is you can clearly see that swath, that diagonal swath. You can also see all the fasteners too, which is 
Uh, it's cool for a roof consultant. Everybody else who owns doing that, but it <laughs> makes me excited. I think it's cool. Yeah, thank you. Plus, um, you know, Derek's a real team player talking about the, the synergies again. You know, he said, well, hey, while our guys are out there with the, the thermal imaging gun, you know, do you want them to, you know, take a shot of some of the panels and see, you know, just see what we're seeing for, um, you know, on the lugs of the panels? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. So, the, this, I didn't want Derek to be the only one with, with uh, videos, so you know I threw one in too. This happens to be um, a pressure test of just some piping in a pre-manufactured or pre-assembled uh, head walls and wet walls that happening at a hospital, and we happened to be there with the architect, and she said, hey, can we see, they were explaining how they do the testing, and she said, hey, can we see the test? And they're like, yeah, sure. So they took one of the sections over and, and hooked it up to, you know, to, uh, uh, Pressure uh, ho hosel, nozzle, um, hose, uh, connected to the other side, pressurized it, guy got down, put some soapy water on the joints, <laughs> said, okay. And she said, is that it? And I'm like, yeah, what did you expect? A pipe to blow up or something? And it made me think that, hey, well, a lot of what we do, the testing, is boring. It's supposed to be, right? If something fails dynamically, that's bad. So. I say successful tests are boring, which is just the way we like them. How does the video stop? Well, you get the idea. So that's the last of the videos. So we've done, gone through uh, design phase and construction phase and acceptance testing, uh, making sure that everything's just working the way it's supposed to. But of course, you know, we move into post-occupancy. Um, I, I use this this picture, real quick story, um, for this fitness center that we did in post occupancy. Saying, well, what the heck, you know, why? What does that have to do with post occupancy? Well, sometimes even the finishes can affect, you know, affect the the design and or, and the commissioning process because um, <clears throat> this was a fitness center. Lighting was designed, you know, for certain foot candles based on a white floor and oh, you can't see it, a white ceiling, but they painted. The, the ceiling black because the white would have shown too much dirt and then put this really dark floor in there and it changed all of the, um, all the reflectances, made the space seem a lot darker. Um, and so we got the call, you know, after the fact. I don't know why they called us because the lighting controls worked just fine. And it's, anyway, so um, same as commissioning plan, one commissioning report that includes all of the disciplines rather than a, a report for the envelope and a report for the MEP systems. That's pretty straightforward. Fun stuff that we really wanted to talk about is some, some lessons learned. We're actually on time. Uh, you know, things that we've seen. And a lot of it has to do with what I call leaky buildings suck. Okay, yeah, see that's, that's a joke, folks. They're still awake. So, we got this coveted 3.30 in the afternoon. I just had my cookies and ready for the reception slot. Um, so typical building, cross-section, you know, air handler or air handlers on the roof or in the attic space or wherever. You're bringing in some outside air. You're mixing it with some return air, supplying air to the space. You got a little exhaust. Yay, everything's great. And we're hoping for the building to be neutral or a little bit positive, right? Because we, we don't want infiltration is our, is our enemy. But they didn't decide to do building envelope commissioning or testing. And I say all the time to anybody that will listen is we can design or commission the most efficient HVAC systems in the world, but if we're not addressing the envelope, if we're not testing the envelope, if we're not commissioning the envelope, what good does it do? Because we start getting you know, some leakage or some infiltration. And with that infiltration, you know, here in our nice, hot, humid Florida climates, it brings water, the water condenses, they start getting mold. Who do they call? They call me. And I like, the, we didn't make the water. The water came from the outside. So we're always constantly having to fight these types of things. Um, but if you're doing an integrated test and Derek's doing his thing and making sure that we, we you know, doing those tests you know, beforehand, then we're not gonna have, hopefully, those water intrusion problems. Um, we seem to see this a lot, or not as much anymore, but used to see it a lot in kitchen hoods. Kitchen hoods used to scare the crap out of me because we kept getting calls all the time for you know these problems, but you know today's short circuit type hood where you know we've got the supply makeup air that's going back up through the exhaust um, is the right way to do it. So in this in this example, you know you've got a makeup air, you got your exhaust from the kitchen hood, 
you got your makeup air, maybe you're drawing a little bit of air from the adjacent space. That's all well and good, right? That's the way it's supposed to work. So when we get to, to, the, to testing it, we try to make sure that we have addressed all of the ways that makeup air unit could possibly fail so that it doesn't. Because obviously, if we take out that makeup air unit and we're just exhausting that, that additional 7,000 CFM is going to come from somewhere, and most of it's going to come from outside. Again, hits the cold surfaces, condenses, they call me, blame me uh, for it. Quick story. Several years ago, we had a facility like this, and one of my partners, Matt Coble, got called out, um, addressed a couple of phone calls. Hey, we're having moisture problems in the kitchen. He's looking at the design. The design looks right. This is a project that, that wasn't commissioned back then, but they called us just to help out. And he goes out there to see what's going on. There was a, a they didn't have a short circuit hood. The supply air from the makeup air was just coming and just dumping down right onto the, to the guy that was working in the kitchen. And you know, he's just sweating profusely because it's hot, humid air, it's 95 degrees outside. So they had installed a nice little switch for him to turn off the makeup air, turn off the makeup air unit. Mac asked, well, what's that switch do? Oh, it turns off this, this hot air coming in here. It's like, you, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. So we've seen lots of strange things like that. It's hard to test for the switch added portion. Right. So uh, we don't have a, a, a good story like that for this one. But this is another one that ties in enclosure and, uh, and MEP, right? So louvers are, louvers are kind of given the pass. I mean, we give windows and storefront and curtain wall. I mean, we give it the, the fifth degree, right? But we just give louvers a pass. Oh, they're, they're allowed to leak. They're allowed to have air pass through them. They're allowed to have water pass through them. Okay, but what about the what about the systems behind that? Is that is that a, a, a semi interior space? Did we did we include air barrier on the walls of that? Are we controlling the passage of, of moisture through those? So just wanted to bring that in as one that oftentimes is missed and uh, is is often included in in, in projects. Oh yeah, yeah that's, snow. that's snow. That's yeah, so we got a little a little bit of snow on the on. The it wasn't a, this wasn't in Florida though. All right. <laughs> for, for in the spring when it melts, that's a, that's a fair point. So another one, Mark touched on it, you know, uh, restaurants are a common one for a lot of exhaust in, in, uh, inside the buildings and we need to make sure that we're not creating a negative pressure and bringing in outside moisture. Schools are another one, we'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, but hotels and hospitality, a big one, right? They have, the, they have the fans in the bathroom, they're on all the time, right? And are they creating negative negative pressure? Is the, are the systems in the hallway able to pressurize the rooms underneath the door? Is anybody putting anything underneath the door to block the passage of that air? Or even without that, was it enough to pressurize those spaces to begin with? These are sealed units for the HVAC. And so then you become increasingly reliant on the building enclosure. This is one that we had uh, where there was just perpetual um, moisture intrusion into this build, into this into these spaces. We found out that the rooms were were excessively negative. And just the solution was just keep replacing the gypsum and keep <laughs> renting the rooms, knowing that the mold is growing in the, in, the, in the wall cavities and destroying the studs, but just keep replacing it and keep renting out the rooms. It's fine. So we, we, were, help, we were able to help out with some of those issues, and that was another joint project. But here's another one with schools, right? You know, we talk about, you know, Mark talks about, oh, well, there's a little puddle of water on the floor. Oh, there's some condensation. Not too scary, right? But when you have things from building enclosure, maybe the, uh, the enclosure wasn't commissioned and then you end up with vapor drive up through the slab. Maybe you needed the blindside waterproofing. You know, most projects now are, are required to have a, a, a vapor barrier under the slab, but, but was it inspected? Was it, was it vetted? Was it complete? Will you have vapor drive later if you had a relatively high groundwater? Going back to the Jacksonville slide, right? Was that was the, the river slide? Do you have a high groundwater? Have you picked up on those things? This is not a cheap fix for this auditorium, for this school <laughs> that likely does not have this in their fiscal budget. Yeah, the, the, the lesson that I guess we're trying to make here is that the water comes from the outside, right? So uh, we're trying to prevent it from coming outside and the vapor drive is one that gets off, gets overlooked a lot. Right. Outside includes under the ground. And here's another one, not necessarily any tie into MEP here, but just to kind of drive home the point of, uh, of some of the things that can happen on building enclosure issues and failures and, and non-diligence, we'll call it. This is uh, looking, you're looking upwards at, 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 a, uh, at a pedestrian bridge at a baseball stadium, right? 
And this was the stucco soffit. And over top of this uh, the pedestrian walkway, they had a traffic coating. And then they had some Eeps bands, some, some decorative foam bands across the top. That floor meets those bands, and there's a gap. And wasn't detailed properly. To make matters worse, it rains every day in Florida, especially during the summer. And they pressure washed that surface after, before and after every event. So they were flooding this with water for years and years and years and years and years. During a renovation of this stadium, the entire section fell down to the ground. There wasn't anybody underneath it at the time, but there could have been. It could have just as easily been on a game day. It could have killed, killed or injured several people. So you don't often think of a building enclosure issue or failure as somebody's going to die. But uh, in this case, they, they certainly But they could. Uh, yeah, they, they could. So make sure you commission the envelope. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. You got it. You're paying attention. <laughs> So anyway, this, that, was, uh, that was our spiel. And you know, in summary, it's, it's, if you're going to do me mechanical commission, go ahead and do enclosure. It is required now in, in LEED V4. Uh, and and uh, several you know, the versions moving forward will likely, likely improve the way it's referenced and the standards of which they reference. But um, it, it can truly be a synergistic process. It doesn't have to be separate. Of course, owner wants it to be, wants it to be synergistic and together. It just oftentimes isn't. Uh, and then, then we end up feeding into some of the misconceptions as, hey, this is going to slow me down. This is going to cost me more money. I'm not going to get the value that, 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 that the industry says that you get from this. If it's done and done properly, it is a, it is a system and a process that can be beneficial. So that, that's our time. You guys, questions. We'll take questions. John. Actual questions. Uplift testing. Right. Uh, roof uplift testing. Is anybody getting behind it anymore? Is FM still behind it? Yes, yeah, so roof uplift testing. We were just at, I don't know if you were at, uh, at RCI, another convention here. And uh, so uh, Richard Cannon, who does the, make the uplift chambers, uh, got on, uh, on this topic. And, and yes, it's still, it's still in favor. But oftentimes, John, a lot of the, uh, the, the pressures of which you test to are hard to even determine, right? So it's, it's, it's a bit ambiguous. Personally, I think it's a good test to do. I think you would probably maybe agree. But it's just as an industry, and this was, this was uh, Richard Cannon's take, is as an industry, we need to do a better job getting together on if it's required, how do we require it, how do, how do we test it, how do we confirm that one, the design pressures are being determined properly because they've, they've made that difficult, right? And if we can clean that up, then can we make it convenient and easily uh, intuitive to figure out what the design pressures are so that you know that you've tested properly. So short, short uh, answer to this question on where do I stand on uplift testing? I like it, as does John, but we do need to do a better job of getting together on how we implement it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Our experience is that they'll buy or, or pay for the MEP testing. They don't want to pay for the building enclosure testing. It's expensive. What, what, what can we used to sell the fact that we really need to do the testing. Yeah, so that we, we get that. Well, Derek hears that all the yeah, time. I, mean, I hear it too. The, the, the thing that works in our favor there is it's not a one-size-fits-all approach on, on how much testing you have to do, right? So any enclosure consultant or testing firm is, is sensitive to, to schedule and budget, right? And so that's part of the process and should be handled in a commissioning process up front during the OPR stage is Okay, one, what type of performance are you after? But two, how far down the line do you want to go to confirm that performance? And does this fit into your budget? And set those standards at the time that, that even maybe before they're getting GMPs from a contractor so they can build that into their schedule. Dropping it on them as a surprise later in the project, that's likely not going to work when all contingency is gone at that point anyway. So to try to answer your question on how, why don't we do more enclosure testing and, 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 and it's too expensive, my take is some can be done on all projects. You're not gonna test all to the nth degree like you would a large scale project, say for a hospital or a critical use building, right? But some testing can be done for all. And that's the job of the enclosure consultant or commissioning agent to talk with that owner and get them the best bang for their buck. How effective is just observation as opposed to construction as opposed to the testing? That happens all the time after the building's built and we have observed that there's water all over. All yeah. over the building, but no, I mean, observation is certainly a good tool, both from MEP and, and enclosure. But you know, we Mark and I did a project together recently where we made it to the end and we got into our acceptance phase and we did all our tests and we did not have one single failure. I would love to stand here and tell you that that's common. 
that we get to the end and during acceptance phase, we don't have any, we don't have any failures. Doing observations full time by anyone, paying anyone to do that is usually impractical, whether it's us as a commissioning agent or a roof inspector or whomever, right? Special inspector of any type, usually impractical. So if you haven't inspected it full time, there is the possibility that some things could have been installed wrongly or poorly. So it can be done on a visual only, but we would like to do, again, some form of confirmation to prove that maybe the areas that we didn't see go down, nobody has that test report, nobody has that, or that inspection report, nobody has those photographs. Let's test in those areas and make sure that they are right. I'd also add that some is better than nothing, right? So if it's between nothing and just some observation, then you take what you, you take what you get and do the observation. You know. I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is about the collaboration between the building envelope and the commissioning agent. In cases where you did that, were you hired together or was it separate firms? Because I've been on projects where it's like totally separate, but I don't know, should we start trying to someone take on a role as well? Sure. So the question was, in case you didn't hear, um, you know, how that teaming comes together. Are we hired together or hired separately? Most of what Derek and I have done together has been procured as, um, t as together, right? Where they say, here are the things we want, want to uh, have commissioned and it's part of the envelope. And you know, if the role, if the envelope is part of it. Now, if the role, which it usually is, is bigger for the MEP, then we'll take the lead and we hire them as a sub-consultant. Um, that's, or if it was the other way around, uh, certainly we've worked you know, for Derek's firms um, sometimes. Uh, I'm a big proponent of it being one team rather than separate. So if if and we've run across that where there's they want to do separate, um, you know, separate procurements, and I recommend against it and say, well, you know, we we think it's better if it's together for all these reasons. But even if they do hire us separately, you know, if we're on it, we're going to do what we can to make sure that it's an as integrated process and communicative as as possible. What was your second question? And then my second question is, what do you do for envelope commissioning? Um, at a post visit, like 10 months in? Post occupancy, so the question is, what do we do on an enclosure uh, 10 months after a post occupancy visit? Really, that, the, the most important thing we do at that time is talk to the people that have spent every day of their life in that time in that building, and right? And what, what are the issues? And you, you may even go to a person that the 10 months, there's, there's people in those offices and just kind of say out loud that you're the enclosure guy, maybe without actually talking to them, and just see what people bring up, right? I mean, we went through this whole process, owner paid for this whole process, shouldn't be a lot of issues there, but there are certain things that come up and maybe things, you know, we've had, we've had them, you know, how many times, Mark? We've turned over a building, everything is tip top. Here you go, here's your report, it's all good. And then they go, you know, we really would have preferred to have some lights here. And they start poking, drilling holes in the exterior walls and putting holes in. So those are the things we're looking for. A lot of times we will take an infrared camera with us as well, see if we can gather any information that way. Um, and, and talk to people, interviews and visual observations, looking for modifications and, and infrared is a lot of what we're doing. I saw some questions back there. Yes, sir. What's your preference on mock-up testing? Um, and kind of coupled with that question, do you prefer in situ or uh, kind of a separate mock-up? All right. I think, every, okay, yeah, great. I think everybody probably heard the questions. What's the preference on mock-up testing? And, and do we prefer in situ or standalone? So I, my preference on mock-up testing is as much as owner can pay for, right? I want to try to do all the tests on the mock-up that I'm going to do in, in, in scale production. Right, so if, if I can, that's my preference, and I want to trip my preference on a on a on a mock-up, whether it be in the laboratory or standalone on site, is to is to collaborate with the architect. I don't want it to really ever be just me. I want the design architect to be in on that, to so that we can bring any problem problem locations together and and get those replicated in a mock-up, and then test for air and water and adhesion, uh, all the things you're going to do in the building on the mock-up. That's my preference. And what was the second part of your question? Well, it's just preference as far as preference is you or on a separate mock-up. Yeah. So my preference there is is a standalone mock-up because generally we're ahead in the schedule. We don't have you know, by the time you got it in situ, that material's ordered. It is on site, and they are blowing and going and putting that putting that stuff on because the next trade's coming right behind them. And a lot of times you just don't have the reaction time to solve any types of issues. So I prefer it to be upfront laboratory mock-up is is best but that's hugely expensive next step down is is uh, is kind of a, a performance and aesthetic mock-up standalone outside the construction trailer moving down in cost is the in-situ mock-up but every time you move down 
you step down and you're really your realistic expectations of what you're going to get out of that process. I've just seen so many that the, the intent was good, the money was there, the, it was in the design, and then by the time it got done, it just it got it got lost in the mire of the schedule, right? And it didn't. I've seen, I've seen mock-ups that just sat there, 85% done, cost the owner 50 grand, right? And then the, then the discussions go back on builder. I want some money coming back because we didn't finish the didn't finish the mock-up, right? And so then we kind of get get woven into those discussions of maybe it's, why it's they important didn't to have note it. that on a renovation too that that's a different thing because you're not going to have a uh, yeah. I'm thinking of a project that Derek and I were doing recently where they're replacing all of the windows in this historic building so there's not really a mock-up and Derek was very adamant about install one or two and then we'll come and do the testing they installed like 50 of them <laughs> and said can you come and test it now and of course you know you find there's some issues and they're all ticked off because they got to redo 50 windows right so it, was, it was in their meeting minutes that came back. <laughs> they, they heard me say it. Yes, sir. In regards to the building pressure stabilization test, uh, is there any way to, uh, I mean, I could pass day one, but during a given day, if we get a negative positive, is there any way to, to monitor that, to give an alarm when that happens? Well, I mean, you can certainly put, uh, put you know, install temporary manometers or, or data logger type of, uh, information stations in the building to track pressures as you go. Obviously it will, it will vary, especially if you're bringing in outside and inside air and when those things cycle on and off. Um, typically though, I've, you know, when you perform that whole building air test, the enclosure's done, the mechanical systems are, are in and done. All the holes in the building are filled, right? So unless you're modifying the enclosure afterwards, the leakage through the enclosure should be the same five, 10 years from now all things, all things, considering you, you haven't put any holes in the walls. Now, now obviously the internal pressures, positive, negative mm -hmm. of a space will change depending on the cycling of the HVAC equipment, especially if it's outside, outside in or exhaust out. Does that somewhat answer your question? Uh, well, I'd just like to get the line Yeah, and, and, and on the HVAC side, we can certainly do that depending on how complex the system is and, you know, put the, we measure the, the outside air coming in and the exhaust air going out and, you know, depending on how complex the building's distribution is, determine if a building or, you know, whole building or part of it has gone negative, but that's usually a much bigger range. It's gone very negative or very positive because, you know, whether the sensors are calibrated that much or somebody just opened the door and held it open. Or they turned off but, the switch. But those are things we, yeah, they okay. turned off the switch and that's an easy one to figure out. But we try to do that wherever we can. More questions? Did I see some more hands? I think that's got it. We just covered it so well. But. Thanks, guys. Well, it's Appreciate about time it. anyway, so thanks, everybody. We'll stick around for a little bit after. <laughs> <laughs>